communicate with you on an ongoing basis. All right, as a matter of a week in review, I thought this morning it would be appropriate to give you a little bit of a week in review and also at the same time give you a week in preview. Now, it has been quite a week. Pastor Tom's been at camp this week with the, with the young people. Lots of stuff going on there. But let me just give you a bit of my week. Tuesday, Jim and I went out to, became garbage collectors this week. We, uh, we'll, we learned that next time we need to have gloves. <laughs> we need to have appropriate shoes. <laughs> And, uh, but we, we went out to some of the homeless camps and collected garbage and picked that up. In the process of that, we met uh, some guys down on the river that uh, we had some conversations with. We listened more than we conversed with them. But in the process of that, we got a Bible study set up for this coming Tuesday down on the river. And it should be, uh, it should be a great time in the Lord. We're looking forward to going and just sharing with those guys again uh, of course, as soon as they found out I was a pastor, all of them were instantly Christians. But, <laughs> but we're going to be sharing from the book of John come, uh, come Tuesday. Uh, we're going to start probably around 10 o'clock with them. So if you remember us Tuesday, that would be great. Uh, on Wednesday this past week, we had a wonderful Bible study right here, also a time of just excellent prayer. I have been so impressed with the time that we spend in prayer together, and I'm thankful for that. But uh, you, you are bringing to this fellowship what I believe it needs. And uh, if you haven't been a part of that prayer time, you really need to come and be a part of that. It is a, a sweet time of prayer. And then Thursday, I went up to camp, and I got the chance to, to sit in on some of the things that happened up there. I will tell you, Miss Nancy is not a show horse. She's a workhorse. <laughs> this lady works, and uh, it was incredible. Uh, she and Sandy both in the kitchen. It was, uh, it was just 100 degrees plus in the kitchen mm -hmm. there, serving up three meals a day to all of these young people, the counselors, the guys like Tom and myself. Yeah. A real hero was John Lindman, who was standing over a big tank of hot water. Okay, and John, John was there, and from what I understand, John was just seeing stuff that needs to be done before next year in the camp. All of that bringing our gifts to the plate of seeing what can be done for, for the Lord to make sure that it's done well and uh, orderly. Uh, so that was a good time, and Pastor Tom shared with you this morning during the, the Sunday school hour a little bit about what happened at camp there. But I can tell you that the young people there, uh, if, if nothing else is true, they love this man and respect him, and therefore his words uh, meant a great deal to them, and many of them. Uh, expressed uh, a, a newfound relationship with Christ as a result of that this past week. So it was an excellent time up there at camp. And then on Friday, on Friday, oh my goodness, Friday. Friday I went out to reggae on the river. <laughs> and I walked around. I took a lot of pictures. I talked to a lot of people in a lot of different venues. And then... I went and sat in the hydration center and just listened a lot. And I listened to people. And one of the conversations I heard I want to share with you because I think this is really prudent to our being here today and also concerns what we need to be doing out there beyond the walls of this church. I was sitting at a table and I had gotten a text message that I was answering and I heard some words that, took me away from my text message. And the words were these, this place is like worship. Hmm. And so I perked up and I listened in. And there were two distinct groups of people. There were some first timers that were probably in their late 20s, early 30s. And there were two ladies probably in their 70s. So this is the conversation between this younger group and this older group. First-timers, late 20s, early 30s, ladies in their 70s, one of whom said that she had been there for every one of these events. And so one of the, the lady that said she had been there for every one of the events looked at the young man that said this was like worship, and she said three things. First, go and have a good time. Second, be careful not to get drawn in. 
And, uh, and I thought, that's an interesting thing. And then she said, the last thing, the third thing, is because it will deceive you. Hmm. It will deceive you. I don't know what it is. Maybe the environment, maybe everything else that's going on there. And so I thought about that this morning. And so I want to bring you a word of encouragement before we go back to our worship and music this morning. Number one... I want you to have a good time. <laughs> Amen. Number two, I want, you, I want you to listen to me carefully. Amen. You can trust him. Amen. That's right. You might not can trust it, but you can trust him. Have a good time. Get drawn closer to the Savior. Mm -hmm. Because you can trust him. You can yeah. trust him. That's why you're here today. You can have a good time being a Christian. And you ought to have a good mm, time that's being right. a Christian. It ought to be a pleasure and a joy. You can get draw close to God. And as you draw closer to him, you can know that you can trust him. And therefore, your worship is complete. Mm -hmm. Your worship is complete. Okay? So stand with me now. Let's continue in song. And James. Dollars, I think, is what, what it amounts to. Okay, we've been talking about the book of Galatians. We've been talking about what it is to be free and have liberty in Christ. And as I, as I did walk around in all of those different venues this past week, one of the homeless camps, out at the youth camp, uh, out at reggae, uh, all of those things kind of came together in what it is to have liberty in Christ, genuine freedom in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. It's very visual, very, very real, and very much, uh, in many cases, kind of in your face. But that liberty that so many people that we met this past week are seeking, is that something to fill that void that God created in every human being, that void that only can be filled by God in, in his appropriate and our appropriate understanding of him. And yet, we will, as human beings in all of our fallenness, because as I walked around there this past week, two things occurred to me. Number one, there but for the grace of God go I. And secondly, that there is a very real need that every human being has to be, have that filled, to have that hole filled. And if we don't know the God of the Bible, Jehovah God, if we don't know him, we will seek to fill, him, fill that void with just about anything that brings us a temporary satisfaction. We can do that with any number of things. And, and quite frankly, we as Christians quite often do that just to fill a gap, to fill a void to take us out of the, the stream of consciousness, to do whatever it takes to avoid the realities that we need God. So we've talked about what this is to, be, to have liberty in Christ, and last week we looked at Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ, and yet I live. Yet it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh I live by faith, very important, in the Son of God, who loves me and gave himself for me. This, this reality of who Jesus actually is and who we are in relationship to him and his desire to have relationship with us is essential that we understand if we're ever to experience this liberty in Christ. Today what Paul is going to do is go back to the Galatians and talk to them about how to stay free. Because here, here is the reality that I think quite often we don't understand. When we are saved, that, that is a moment in time, and it's an instantaneous thing that happens when we receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of our life. It is a free gift of God to us, and all we need to do is just receive it. Just receive the free gift. He offers it to you, and he says, receive it. And in an instant that you receive it, and you really genuinely come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, you are saved. And nothing can ever change that. 
But Paul is talking about to the Galatians about living in that freedom every day of our life. Now that challenge is a different challenge because that challenge is renewed moment by moment, day after day in all of our lives. We must face the reality that when we wake up tomorrow morning, here's, here's the truth concerning, I think, almost every Christian, you may not feel saved. You may not feel good physically. You may not feel good emotionally. You may not feel good even spiritually. That reality is there for every single Christian. Listen to me carefully. There is a war going on, maybe at that point not for your soul if you have genuinely accepted Christ, but there is a war going on for your testimony. There is a war going on for your attitude in Christ. There is a war going on that desires, that, that the enemy desires to use you to not bring God glory, and in fact to do quite the opposite, to be a defeating cause in the war that's going on, and that he can defeat the very testimony of Jesus Christ. That war is very real, it's something we've got to deal with every day, and it's something that's not instantaneous. You may have been told that everything's going to be cool when you accepted Christ, but let me tell you, I'm here to tell you this morning that, yeah, it's cool, but there's still a war going on. There's still a reality that you must fight this battle every day. Now, I told you last week. In fact, I pleaded with you last week on my knees. Not to try to do this in the flesh. But there is still something that you must appropriate. Pastor Tom taught at camp this past week. He had the purpose to get out of bed to go up there to do what he, what he was called to do there. He didn't get there because he was saved. He got there as a result of him getting up and, and saying, okay, I have committed to doing this, I'm going to go do it. By the end of the week, I can tell you because I was there, Miss Nancy didn't feel like going back into that kitchen. Now, it wasn't because she expressed that to me, but I could see how weary she was. And yet she purposed to go back in there to feed those children physically so that they could be fed spiritually. This is, this is the work of, of being saved. It's called sanctification. All of us have the purpose in our hearts to go do what God has called us out to do. It doesn't just happen to us like our original salvation. It is something we must be attentive to. But again, I'll, I'll, I'll plead with you again. Don't try to do this in the power of the flesh. This is something that is a gift of God, yes, and it is a calling to you of God, and it is something that if you will purpose and then give yourself to the power of the Holy Spirit that if you're saved lives in you, then yes, you will still get weary, but as I always say, it's a good tired. It's a healthy spiritual weariness it is a fulfillment that comes in that weariness so don't think that you're failing if you if you get up in the morning and you go man I just got tired the other day serving the Lord was I was I focused on the wrong thing was I trying too hard listen if you are just determined in your flesh to do these things right that's not going to win it for you but if you will determined to follow Jesus and let him live through you, or what I call surrender, surrendering to him to allow him to live through you, then he will live through you, and he will have, be, have victory through you, and there will be a point in time, I promise you, if you do this, that you'll step back and you'll look at what's just happened. Pastor Tom can experience it this past week, but you heard him share with you during Sunday school that you can look back at those events and go, Look how God used even me. And that's when you go, yes, I understand. I understand. That, that's what it's all about, is yielding, surrendering to him. It, yet, it's not that I just lay down on top of mountains and go, okay, God, pick me up with your mighty wand and put me over there and then treat me like a marionette. He's not that kind of God. It's important that we understand the God of the Bible. I listened to people all this past week in the homeless camp, Jim can tell you. 
over there Friday afternoon. I can tell you what transpired. What transpired was this. People looking for something to fill that hole that God designed in every human being in order that we might seek him, find him, and be fulfilled in him and live his life out through us that he might be glorified and that we might be fulfilled and brought to a great sense of joy. This sanctification process, let me tell you, is not easy. Why is it not easy? It's because there is a war. And you, if you don't acknowledge that there's a war going on for your testimony, you will probably never be a testimony of Christ. There's a war going on. It is, it is for your, your very heart, your very soul, your very attitude. And no, if you're saved, you can't lose your salvation, but you can lose your testimony. The Bible says you can quench the very Spirit of God. And we're not, to, we're not to be about quenching the very Spirit of God. So all of that is the foreground for all of this. And he's going to go back, Paul's going to go back and start looking at some things that are very real, not only in the lives of people then, but in the, our lives today. These same challenges are very real in us today. If you'll listen and hear, this idea and understanding of staying free is a, is a very active part of every Christ follower. Did you know that you can have that experience of being saved and not be following Christ today? Now, here, here's two, before we get into this, here's two very dangerous places that we need to look at. First, you can come to church all your life. You can act in great discipline. And you can, you can put on a happy face and never really be saved. And I want you to analyze this this morning because if you've never had that change of heart in you where you can go back and identify, maybe not the moment that you were saved, but that, that very real change in you that, that goes, only God could do that because that is not in my human nature. If you've never had that, you need to be thinking about whether or not you really have accepted Christ as Lord and Savior of your life because if you have, He will begin to work in you. Doesn't mean you won't backslide. Doesn't mean you won't fall off the, the, the wagon, so to speak. It, it, it means that you simply are not listening and hearing from God because you've, you've built something between you and Him. Sin stands between the Christian and a holy God. And that barrier, that 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 wall that stands that is, divides us is something that we have control to tear down. I have things in my past that I can look at and I can, get, I can get all hung up on and that can tear me down. I have issues that I can focus on and that can take me away from Him. I have relationships that I, if I don't bind and heal that can take me away from him I've got things in my life that I might seek pleasure in more than him and that can take me away from him I, have, I started off last Sunday morning by asking you two questions number one if I could show you a way that you could genuinely grow closer to God and your, your relationship with him would be genuinely different you could hear from him he would lead you and you, you, you would have a closer walk with him than you ever had before how many of you would want that? And a lot of you raised your hands. And then I ask you this question. What if it was going to cost you something? What if it was going to cost you something very dear to you, very important to you? Maybe your house or your car or your bank account or investments. What, what if, it, what if it, all of that was the cost of growing close to God? And I ask you to be honest and raise your hands. And less than half of you raised your hands again. The difference is understanding, I believe this is the difference, the difference is understanding how precious that relationship is. How absolutely powerful that relationship is in your life. And how glorious it is, how rejoicing it is, how cleansing it is to live in that state of mind. And it is a state of mind. It is a choice you're going to make to either be a Christ follower or to be a pew sitter. It's a choice all of us make. We do that. And we're called to do that. It's the difference in being 
saved, maybe, maybe not, and being in an active walk, in an active walk with the Lord. So, if you've got your Bibles, turn to the book of Galatians, chapter 5. We'll begin in verse number 1, and we'll proceed through there relatively quickly. So Christ has really set us free. This is a pretty strong and bold statement. Christ has really set us free. As I walked around over at Reggae Friday, here's one of the things that I, that I realized. Every single person there, and you heard it from the stage, from the artists, you heard it walking around just talking to people, you heard this truth. I just want to be free. I just want to be free to do this or that. I just want to be free. I think that was an old song some years ago. I just want to be free. You see, here's the problem. Listen, listen, to, listen to me carefully here. Here's the problem. Until you have experienced walking with the Lord, you have no idea what freedom is. You have no idea what freedom is. And so you make up this thing in your mind of what you think freedom is, and you seek after that in all the wrong places. And you find yourself caught up in stuff that, in, that the lady was warning about. Don't get drawn into it. Don't get drawn into it. You cannot trust it. When you're drawn into Christ and you learn firsthand you can trust Him, there is a difference in you that will be manifested. And you will learn to live a happier, more rejoicing, more free life than you've ever lived here in your life. And that's the reality. He says you, you are set, fr set free in Christ, now make sure that you stay free. Don't be drawn back into the things of the world. Don't be drawn back into the temptations, the things that, that took you away from God to begin with. Don't be drawn back in, as the lady warned this young man. Don't be drawn in. Learn how to stay free. That's what Paul is going to talk to us about this morning, is staying free. How do you stay free? So last week we looked at what it is to walk in, in the Spirit, to live what I called the Christ life, what it is. Today we're going to look at how do we do that? How do we walk in the Spirit of God? And don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. I thought it was about sin. Do you know you can, you can legitimately be a Christian and then be trying to follow the law, and the law bind you up, and you not have freedom? I'm talking about the Old Testament law. Do you know how many rules and regulations the, the Jewish leaders made so that you would be keeping the law? There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little rules, like how many steps you can take in a day on the Sabbath without working. Whether you could collect an egg the chicken laid that morning. I mean, those are all to keep you from falling out of the law. We're going to see this morning, Paul is going to give you a very simple resolution that if we will live that one thing, we will in our nature, in our nature be keeping the law. Because he says it's not about the dots and the T's being crossed and the I's being dotted. It is about your spirit living in the very Spirit of God. That's what it's about. How to stay free. Paul's word has a play on words here. In the first couple of verses, I'm not going to go over these verses. This is, a, this is a little instrument that I got in Africa. When a young man turns 18 and he's a, one of the tribal members uh, of, of several of the different tribes there, they go up on a hillside, they put on a red blanket over their shoulders, and they're circumcised with a knife that looks just like this. This is what this is, a circumcision knife. It's about the keeping of their tradition so that they might be purified and become a men. And this little knife, he says, 
Those that wish to peritomo, peritomo, it is, it's a word that it means to, para is to go around, and tomo is to cut, to cut around. He said, but rather than listen to them, I would that they would apokotomo. That, what he's saying is, I wish that they would just cut it all off. There's a stronger word used in some translations that means to castrate, totally. He's, he's, he's got a little play on words there to say, it's, you're no more about keeping the law in one of these words than with the other. The catatomo was to cut it off. He said, you're just as well off one way as the other. I want you to know it's not about the keeping of the law. He says that right up front in, in chapter 5. And then he's, the question becomes, where do obedience and action and these imperatives fit into the grace paradigm? What, what do I need to do within grace to really be a Christ follower? Do, does it take effort? I, I found that it took effort for me to get up this morning. This, has been, this week has been a very long week. Diverse week for me. I've been very active. I've been going at it pretty strong, long hours, without a lot of rest, doing a lot of physical stuff. And just to be honest, when I woke up this morning, I just soon turned over and gone back to sleep. It took effort. Does that mean that I'm working for my salvation? No, it means that I am appropriating the gifts that God has given me to do the work God has given me to do, and yes, I purposed to come here today. I didn't just manifest here. And, and, and you will not find yourself just here one moment and sitting on top of a mountain somewhere humming another moment. You will find yourself presented with the challenge of living out your faith with the spiritual gifts God has given you. We're fished up the Wednesday night spiritual gifts, we'll talk about a few other people on this coming Wednesday nights. But listen, to take that gift and employ that gift for the kingdom of God. And in that, you will find a couple of things happen. When you are genuinely walking in the spirit and, and working in the kingdom, you will find that that very effort, listen, listen to what I'm going to tell you, is healing that it brings healing to you as well as to other people. I, when every, every place I went this week, such a diverse week for me, but everywhere I went this week, I found that I was being healed as God was using me to bring a message to someone else. My spirit was rejoicing. My, my, my person was being revived. My freedom was being established. One of the things we need, we need to understand as we go out into this community and beyond is that we're not, we're not free to sin. We're free from the very penalty of sin, from this persistence of sin to dominate our lives. We're free from those things. And that makes us free to go out and bring real life to other people. There's a difference, and we've got to understand what freedom is. Verse 13, you, my brothers, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature. Boy, did I hear, did I hear about freedom Friday. I want freedom. I want freedom to do this and freedom to do that. Freedom to fall right into the place the enemy would have me. Freedom to do that. And that kind of freedom... To do that will always bring you to a very dark place. It always will, all that enticing joy, the power of that joy, that, that sense of escape, that, that sense of real freedom to do those things. And ultimately, it brings a burden that defeats. Christ, free, freedom in Christ never, ever, ever does that. It is a genuine freedom and a joy that revives and doesn't tear down. 
that brings life and not death, that, br that brings genuine freedom, not addiction. Yes, the deception of it all. Rather, it says, uh, do not use your freedom to indulge in the sinful nature, but serve one another in love. I want you to see what it means to be free. To serve one another in love is really what it's all about. Obviously possible to use grace wrongly. God's grace will allow you to make decisions. And in your, this time we're on the earth, the time that we are supposed to be being sanctified, being made more holy, being brought closer to God, being made of more service, we can choose to indulge everything else in our lives but those things, if that's what we want to do. And God will allow you to do that. And those things will ultimately bring you down, and then when you get to the bottom, you've got a choice to make then. Do you go beyond the bottom, or do you look back and say, I'm headed the wrong direction, and do what the Bible talks about. Here it is. Watch this. Repent and go the other way. It's our choice. And God gives you that choice. You have a will, and you can make that choice. So why not use good grace for the license of sin? I've just covered that. So, Spirit's impact on your heart. It is very real. It is life-changing. I've told you before, I had no desire to be here or to serve God in any way 25 years ago. I had no desire to do anything but serve me. And I knew that if, if, if anything was going to change in that, that God would have to do that part. Because I, I couldn't change that. My nature was not to love you. My nature was not to do anything to, to teach God's word. When God changes the human heart, you find your joy in different things than you used to find them. And that, that change that happens in our life is a very real change. That now, my, my des greatest desires in life, I'm looking at and I'm thinking, well, I think that's God's desire for me. And I used to look at those things, the desires I had in my heart, and I, I, I could pretty quickly tell you, even though I didn't know God, that that would not be what he would want for me. Those were my desires. It changes the human heart. It has an impact. Sin is destructive. Sin tears down. Sin will put you in a place you think you, you started down a road of pleasure and you end in a road of defeat. It tears lives apart. It tears marriages apart. It tears churches apart. Sin is destructive. It enslaves. We were in Colorado, and I've, I've told parts of this story before. The, the secretary of the church when I got there, I didn't know at the time, but as it turned out, was caught up in a very deep pornography. The secretary of the church. And I couldn't counsel her. Elva tried to counsel her. Elva did a, a remarkable job counseling her. But she would come home and she'd say, have you ever heard of this? And I'd go, no, never heard of that. You talk about deep, destructive sin, stuff goes on that tears down. And she, and she told Elva, she said, I started down this road for a little bit of pleasure. And now I can get none. I can have none. I never find any pleasure in anything. I just try to keep my nose above the water line. It's destructive and it's enslaving. It binds us. It leads to unhappiness rather than what we sought for, which was the happiness to begin with. And it's harmful to ministry. It's harmful to this living for the love of other people and serving people in love. It's harmful toward that. You can't love somebody else if you're so caught up in trying to keep your nose above the water line that you, that you just, that's all you can think about, it's all you can do. Talked to a young lady this week, said, I've got a heroin habit. 
She said, that's all that matters to me. It's all that matters to me. My child doesn't matter to me. My mother and father don't matter to me. This is all I think about from the moment I wake up to the time I finally go to sleep is I think about heroin. I've got to have it. It enslaves. It starts out as a pleasure-seeking thing or to escape the realities of this world, and it enslaves. Grace is not about the freedom to sin, but the freedom from the power of sin. Let me talk about salvation just a moment. Just as salvation comes in three parts, what are they? Class. The three parts of salvation. When you're first saved, it's saved from sin. Saved from sin. Justification. The, the part we're in now is living this life every day is sanctification. And then the last part, when you draw your last breath and you come face to face with the Lord, that is glorification. Just as salvation comes in three parts, this, this freedom from sin comes in three parts. Let's look at them. Freedom from the penalty of sin. That's the day you're saved. The day you were saved, every possibility of you having to pay the price, the penalty of sin, went away. Why? Because Jesus Christ paid the price in full. It's all paid in full. You're free at that moment from the very penalty of sin. Then there's freedom in this life if we are being sanctified from the power of sin. And it, that as we walk in this life, and we're walking in the Christ life, being, walking in the Spirit, we are being freed from the power of sin to dominate our lives. And that's what I was talking about early on this morning. It's trusting Him. The woman said to the young man, don't trust it. Whatever it is, don't trust it. But I'm telling you, you can trust Him. And, and it's the power of sin that is that we're relieved from. It doesn't mean we won't sin. It means that the sin does not dominate over us in such a way as to have power over us. We don't have that any longer. And then that very day that we draw that last breath, we're removed from the very presence of sin. Amen? We can rejoice with those that have passed because they're, if they were no Jesus Christ, they're, they're removed from the very presence of sin. And we can rejoice about that. Romans 6.14 For sin shall not be your master. Because, here's, here, here's why. You are not under the law. You're under His grace. But you, this grace is, is not something that is temporary or insufficient for you ever. No matter what, here's the thing Pastor Tom's telling those young people this past week. No matter what's going on in your life. So you have no mother at home. That's hard. You have no daddy at home. That's hard. You, you've got no home. You've got stuff, you've got stuff in your life that, that looks like it's just trying so desperately to conquer you. You can know that you have freedom in Christ and you don't have to be dominated by those limitations over you. You can have that, still have that freedom that we're talking about. No matter what the circumstances of life are. Is it hard? You bet it's hard. Ought we to come alongside those young people? Absolutely. Pastor Tom's starting team perseverance for those young people there. To have a follow-up out of camp. Let me tell you, I don't even go do ministry anywhere, anywhere, that there's not a possibility for genuine follow-up to happen, whether it's me or somebody else that does it, that I trust. I'm, I commend him for that. We're, there, there's going to be a follow-up out of that, and he's going to make sure these young people have something in hand on an ongoing basis to continue to remind them that this wasn't just a fleeting moment in time that they made these decisions. They made the decision, and Christ is still with them. Matthew 28, 18, and 19. I will be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. This word ministry is the word to serve. Here, here's what I want you to know about that. I am not the only minister in this church. And Pastor Tom and I are not the only two ministers in this church. Every single one of you that know the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior have a designated ministry that God has for you. Everyone. 
There's, there's, not, there's not any exception. You have a ministry. In a way, we are but the ones who bring the equipping for you to do the ministry. It's you that does the ministry. And I challenge you to be about that because this ministry not only brings life and love to other people, but it will allow you to find real healing and joy in your own life. You talk about fulfill, You talk about freedom. There's more freedom in this than anything else I've ever done. I, I had businesses at a, time, at a time that I had lots of money. And I th- I, my thought was, if I had lots of money, I'd be free. Do you know how burdensome that was? It was huge in my life. I woke up one morning, morning my 40th birthday. We had a place at the coast on an island just off the coast of South Carolina. We had a motor home, a horse farm. Uh, we were breeding championship Arabian horses. We had all the stuff that people looked at and went, that's glorious. Man, you were really free. And I remember going down to the barn that morning. There was this Mexican guy that was working with us there. And he came up to me and he said, Dave, uh, don't hate to tell you this, but the tractor's broke down. The manure spreader doesn't work. None of the waterers are working in the fields for the horses. We've got to get them some water. You've got 40 head out there. You've got to get them some water. Dump truck. Hydraulics don't work on it. And I looked at that and thought, this is freedom? (laughs) I had enough money to get me burdened and not enough to get me out. Burdened. This ministry, the serving of other people in love, that's what every single one of you need to be doing in order to find your liberty in Christ. Part of our mission is to come alongside. Some of you are going to go out Tuesday with us to one of the camps and have a Bible study. Some of you won't find that very comfortable. It's not a very comfortable place. It's not pleasant to be with some of the guys that just sit and curse every other word. But to serve the Lord in a place you can genuinely make a difference, you'll find joy, you'll find freedom, and you'll find healing. The life of servant love is God's will for every one of us. Don't come to me and ask, is it God's will for me to serve in love? I'm telling you right now, it is. You don't have to ask. You don't have to pray about it. Understand what I'm saying? It's God's will that you serve him and serve other people in love. That is his will for you. It brings life to others, and it leads to happiness and joy in your own life. And it is self-feeding. What do I mean by that? As you do it, you want to do more. Nancy said before she went to camp this year, my last year, I'm not doing this anymore. And she told us when she came back in here today, we're already planning for next year. How can we do it better? It's... <laughs> yeah, you, you do forget the, the, the tired because it was a good tired. You do forget the weariness because it led to some place that genuinely was serving God. And you see the greatness in all of that. And it, you will be rewarded. And listen, you might think that I'm just talking about the next life. Yes, that's true. But you'll be rewarded in this life, even no matter what your circumstances that surround you the physical circumstances, you'll find reward in what I call fulfillment in really serving God in ways that he has gifted you and equipped you. Verse 14, for the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Here it is. Here is your key to freedom. Are you ready? Here it is. Love your neighbors as yourself. Now the the law keepers don't like this verse very much. But herein lies the real joy of knowing God. Love your neighbor, agape. We talked about that last week. Agape your neighbor as yourself. Did it say, agape your friends? Is that what it said? 
Well, it's included in that, but does it say that exclusively? No. Agape, your, just your family. Just agape the people in your church. Because that's where your brothers and sisters are. I said neighbor. It didn't say anything about brothers and sisters, did it? Your neighbor. Some of my neighbors aren't terribly lovely. They're not. It's my calling. And more than that, it's your calling. Love your neighbors yourself. This is a principalized ethic. It's not about how many eggs you collect on a, on a Sabbath day. It's not about how many steps you made on a Sabbath day. It's about how you have loved your neighbor. Have you genuinely stepped out in sacrificial love for somebody else, using the gifts God has given you? Is that what you've done? Verse 16, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. I want you to notice what it doesn't say. It does not say don't carry out the desires of the flesh and then you will be walking by the Spirit. Do you hear me? Because that's the cart we get before the horse. You understand what I'm saying? That's the cart we get before the horse as Christ followers. I just try hard. Yes, it takes effort. It says, walk by the Spirit and then you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. You wake up one morning and you're given a gift. Let's compare it to the gift of the Spirit. The Spirit gives you gifts. You wake up one morning and you're given a gift. You go to the mailbox, you open the mailbox, there's an envelope there addressed to you, you open it up and there's a check for $2 million. And you go, this can't be real. You look at it. Boy, that could bring a lot of satisfaction. But it's probably not real. I'll, I'll just lay it over here. After all, Gilligan's Island's on. <laughs> but then it begins to worry you, and you pick up the check, and you think, well, it's written on this bank, and I know this bank is a legitimate bank. Okay, so I want to go down to the bank and just see if, I mean, could it be real? And you go down to the bank, and they go, they look up the account, and they go, yeah, it's legitimate tender. I mean, you, that's real. And so the teller asks you, what do you want me to do with it? And you said, tens and twenties, please. <laughs> and and you, you load it up, and it's a big bag, and you carry it back home, and you have a big party, and you invite all your friends, and they come, and you go, wow, I can't believe you got this check, $2 million. What, a, what an incredible thing, man. You got this gift, this wonderful gift. And you go, and they go, can't believe you, you, you didn't have to do anything for that. And you go, what? Boy, wait a minute. I open the envelope. I had to walk down to the bank. The money was heavy. Had to lug that stuff back home. I did something. But you were given a gift. Today, you have been given a gift. If you're, if you're a Christ follower today, you've been given a gift. You have at least one spiritual gift, and God has given you the gift of doing ministry to serve others and finding your genuine fulfillment in life. You'll have more fulfillment serving him than anything else you can do. You might sit here this morning and think, well, sure, you're going to say that to your pastor. You just, you, you're, you're called here just to preach the word. Just sure you're going to say that, but listen, test me and see if this isn't true. See if there's not more joy in serving other people in the power and in the love of the Holy God. And see if you're not brought to a place of genuine fulfillment. Walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh.
So what does it mean to walk in the Spirit? Let's look at Romans chapter 8. We'll, we'll end with this this morning. Romans chapter 8, verse 4. God has worked so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God has worked. He's done the work so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. If you, here's what I'm talking about when I'm talking about that. <clears throat> Try hard. That's walking by the flesh. Even as a believer, you can find yourself caught up in walking in the flesh. How does somebody like Nancy go to camp, work those long hours, so she, they're cleaning up after the evening meal on Thursday. I said, well, now maybe you can get a little rest. She said, I'll start making cinnamon buns in 10 minutes for tomorrow morning. How can she be happy in that? How can she feel genuinely blessed by that? Wouldn't it be a more a blessing if somebody just came alongside and said, Nancy, go to bed. I'm going to fix these biscuits for you. She was blessed. Understand what we're talking about. <laughs> I didn't get a one. <sighs> hint, hint. I want you to notice quickly in the, this next section the mindset. This is what we're called to do, is set our minds on him. This mindset is the change that happens within the Christian that says, I'm going to start walking in the Spirit of God. The mindset that you have the power to change. Look at this quickly. The worldview, the posture we put ourselves in, and the joy that results. Watch it. For those who are w walking according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. You want to not be walking in the things of the flesh? Don't set your minds on the things of the flesh. Got that one? Check mark? Okay. But those who are according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Set your minds on the things of God. Set their minds on the things of the Spirit, for the mind set on the flesh is death. How many volunteers we got for death this morning? This kind of death is a total separation from God, always. Separation from God in this world brings drudgery, it brings burdens, it brings slavery. For the mindset on the things of the flesh is death, but the mindset on the spirit is life and peace. How many times have I sat down with somebody for counsel and they start off by crying and I can, I can see it coming. Pastor, all I want is a little peace. Just need some peace. This is peace. Set your mind on the things of God. Verse 7, because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. We've seen that God has done it all for us, and we choose to go to that bank, employ that power that he has lived in us, accept and receive the joy of serving him through serving other people. And in that, we are the ones that are rewarded and find joy and peace and contentment. Even when, and this is the key that Pastor Tom's message was for the children this week at camp, even when everything else in our life is coming apart, even when my daddy beats me. Even when I come home. Little boy in Arkansas, I started having conversations with. I met him in family court. He came to family court with a t-shirt on that had a finger like this on it pointing up and the message underneath it says, you want trouble? Look here. <laughs> that was what he, he had standing before the judge. And I developed a relationship with this kid, and he told me every night I come home, 
I come home not knowing if I'll wake up the next morning because of what my, how my mama lives. Because when she's out of her head, she just does crazy things, and he lived with his mom. He told me about a time that, that his mother was, had such an alcohol-induced stupor that she was withdrawing from alcohol poisoning, and he slept at the back door, nailed the front door shut with a hammer and a nail, and slept at the back door so that his mama wouldn't go out during the night and get more. And I told him, I said, you can have peace in the midst of all of that. You can have joy in the midst of all that. You can find real glory and joy in serving God, and you can have that peace that, as Philippians 4 says, passes all human understanding. We're going to look at that next week. What does this have to do with our spiritual growth? Well, here it is. Simply put, it's this, this way. If you are sitting here this morning and you have accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are saved and nobody can take that away from you. Nobody can take it away. And If you want joy in this life and you want peace and contentment in this life, and you want the genuine fulfillment that you think that all these other things will bring you. Give yourself totally to Him. And trust Him who lives in you to work power through you and give you unction and live out His life through you in such a way that He is glorified and you are satisfied. You hear what I'm saying? There's a difference between just existing as a Christian and being a genuine Christ follower. And the difference is manifested in the joy and peace and contentment that you will have. Here's the key. Listen to me. If you hadn't heard anything else I've said so far, listen to me right now. It's your choice. It is. It's your choice. Father God, 